This podcast is part of the Deluxe Edition Network. To find other great shows on the network, head over to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. That's deluxeeditionnetwork.com. Always a family guy skit. <laughs> so, hey, everybody, welcome to episode 151 of Films and Fermentation. That's right, we are Films and Fermentation, the movie and alcohol podcast. I'm Leo. I'm Kevin. I'm Mike. We're three friends who like to talk shit about movies while getting shit faced. In case you weren't able to coax it out by that little mini intro we did there, tonight's episode is all about Alan Erkman. Alan yeah, this is episode 151. It's also our season finale. We're going to take a, a short little break. Mike's going to be going away on vacation, so we're going to be coming back with a new episode in a couple of weeks. So we're going to be closing out season eight tonight by taking a look at the career of Alan Rickman. In the vast constellation of stage and screen, they're shown a star with unique brilliance, Alan Rickman. With a voice that could coax honey from a stone and a gaze that could freeze time itself, Rickman walks through the realms of cinema and theater with the grace of a master. From the melodious voice of Severus Snape to the over-the-top Sheriff of Nottingham to the dashing villainy of Hans Gruber and everything in between, his characters were old friends inviting us into worlds both fantastical and familiar. Like a wizard with his spells, Rickman could enchant audiences with a mere flick of his wand or the raise of an eyebrow. His career was a tapestry woven with laughter and tears, each thread a testament to his unparalleled talent. As we raise our wands to this titan of stage and screen, let's celebrate the magic he brought into our lives and the legacy he leaves behind. Depressive robot. <laughs> Don't forget to drop us an email at filmsofermentation at gmail.com or visit linktree.com slash filmsofermentation to find all of our social media and podcast links. We are now on Reddit. If you search for r slash pod r slash films fermentation pod you can join our reddit community you could also become part of the films fermentation by, uh, family by supporting us on patreon or buying our merchandise at teespring.com and visit us at the deluxe edition network to find out more about us and the other podcasts go to deluxe deluxe edition network.com the den where you can check out our podcast as well as the podcast of the month for the month of may the steve and crypto show and don't forget to tell them about the website. We got a website now. We got a website. The link is Just on linktree.com. <laughs> yes. Films and fermentation. Look it up in the Google thing. Yeah, Google it. We got it. Google it. Hey, Google. Hey, so Google. We, uh, yeah, we got a website now for three years. <laughs> We're working at the bugs. <laughs> we'll be right back after this word from the Deluxe Edition Network. 
The Deluxe Edition Network, also known as The Den, is an incredible podcast network that offers a wide variety of entertaining and informative podcasts. With a lineup of shows covering various topics, such as interviews with a wide variety of guests, history, music, relationships, true crime, and so much more. The Den provides content that caters to a diverse range of interests. The hosts and guests on the Deluxe Edition Network demonstrate a deep passion and expertise in their respective fields, making each episode on each show engaging and thought-provoking. The network fosters a sense of community by encouraging listeners to interact through live chats, social media, and forums, creating an inclusive environment for discussion and sharing opinions. With its commitment to high-quality production, the shows in the Deluxe Edition Network continue to captivate and entertain its ever-growing audience. Whether you're a podcast enthusiast or someone looking to explore new topics, The Den is a fantastic platform to dive into and uncover fascinating insights from experts in their fields. The Deluxe Edition Network is the home of independent awesomeness. To find all these great podcasts in one convenient location, head over to DeluxeEditionNetwork.com. That's DeluxeEditionNetwork.com. All right, so let's get to it and talk about some drinks this evening. So, I decided uh, tonight I was going to do something slightly themed. Um, Alan Rickman was in a movie called Bottle Shock, which is about uh, Steve Spurrier, who was a real-life uh, vineyard and, and wine sommelier who introduced uh, Napa Valley wines to the French wine competitions in, in the 1980s and it's uh one of his lesser known films but i was like oh it's a wine film and that was his drink of choice in life he was a wine drinker so i was like i want to have some wine tonight first wine i wanted to drink uh was awful because it went bad somehow so i ended up having to go to an alternate so i'm drinking uh some prosecco lamarca prosecco white wine which is 11 percent alcohol by volume pretty good we used it to make mimosas this weekend i was tempted to do that but i'm like no it's not breakfast so, <laughs> so next who's, who's next i'll go i'll go i am drinking something that's really odd for me to be drinking i am drinking a southern tier french toast imperial ale hmm. 8.6 percent alcohol by volume and you guys could probably smell the maple syrup. <laughs> so it you. Smell that one. It's it's delish. It is a uh, quite a treat. It is a Twilight Zone episode though to see Mike drinking a French toast beer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Were your sugars good today? Uh, it's one of the few beers <laughs> I still in the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> how is it? What do you like? How do you think about it? It's not bad. A little not sweet. Bad. My taste. A little sweet. Yeah, it's got that maple flavor to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, what really you got going on? The egg in it. <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> the egg batter. I am drinking two from um, Great Lakes Brewing Company. Uh, I will start with the. Um, do I want to start with that one? Yeah, I will start with this one. Now I'm going to do the Dortmunder Gold Lager which is balanced and smooth, a classic award-winning balance of sweet malt and dry hop flavors, proudly waving the flag for Cleveland and refreshing beer drinkers everywhere since 1988. So I'll be drinking that and then chasing that with a uh, Great Lakes Mexican lager with lime, which is a... Find a sunny spot and lounge a while with this golden Mexican-style lager brewed with real lime peel and puree and flaked corn for a crisp and refreshing getaway. This is 5.4% alcohol by by volume. I like the Great Lakes uh, Brewery. They Mm -hmm. usually have pretty good stuff. I've drank their historical brews, like like the Elliot Ness and the the Al Fitzgerald and things like that. So I'm not sure about these. I haven't had these before, so curious to see what you think of them. It's okay. It's a solid beer. It's a beer beer. (laughs) That's the lager. That's the lager. The Dortmunder Gold. (laughs) All right. So uh, I was telling you guys in pre-show, I was uh, listening to another pod this week. They were talking about Jerry Maguire 
and talking about how highly quotable a film it is. And I was like, man, it is a really, really good film for, for, for quotes. Um, but I was curious to see what other people out there thought about that. So I went on all of our socials and uh, gathered some answers from Instagram, TikTok, uh, X, and Facebook. Uh, just to see what some people thought is the most quotable film of all time. Um, so do you guys have a film you want to add to this before we look at the, the shout out list here? Um, Spaceballs for me. <laughs> Spaceballs, highly quotable. I said Jerry mm-hmm. Maguire is pretty quotable. I think The Godfather is a very quotable film. Ghostbusters. Uh, Ghostbusters is a highly quotable film. Mm-hmm. Uh, you said Blazing Saddles before the show, Mike, which we've covered on this program and delicately danced around some of our favorite quotes from that film. <laughs> Police Academy. Police Academy. Uh, short um, Circuit. <laughs> I think only have a short circuit is Johnny Five is Alive. <laughs> Clark. I was thinking. I was thinking. Um, Terminator and Terminator Two are pretty good uh, quotable films. Predator as a is a really good quotable film. You are one ugly, ugly motherfucker. motherfucker. I was also thinking. Uh, Total Recall. Get your Astamaz. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so here's what you say, Rocky. Rocky, another one. Um, yeah. So before we get too far off on a tangent, uh, Kevin was just speaking to his students today about how highly quotable Jaws is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so all I asked the, uh, all the scenes they went, and sure. they went, "What movie? What movie? <laughs> is this from the seventies? This is old." <laughs> Didn't help that I had to tell them that the actress who was who played Chrissy just passed away on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I asked the question on the socials: What is the most quotable film of all time, in your opinion? And I said we'd give a shout out to anybody who gave us an answer. So we have a few people who uh, who uh, sent us some responses. We got Pods R Us on Instagram. Uh, Pods R Us is awesome. They're always uh, reposting and sharing our our links whenever we have a new episode out um uh they said super bad which you know for me it's mostly the mclovin stuff Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh or when uh they're trying to get a glimpse of this girl who has really big breasts and he's like come on let's hurry up we gotta go get a catch a glimpse of these warlocks (laughs) (laughs) i think my favorite line in the film is uh where he's talking about when he was a kid and he used to draw uh stuff or uh, Jonah Hill was a kid. He would draw dicks all the time on on paper, and they were all different shapes and colors and sizes. And his parents put him in therapy because they were worried about him, and they made him stop eating food that looked like uh, that looked like phalluses. <laughs> and he says to Michael Sarah, he's like, you know what kind of foods don't <laughs> look like dicks? All the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was a good one. So Pazer us, thank you for that little uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, contribution there. Super bad. The magic number is three when it comes to TV podcast on X. They are actually uh, new followers of ours, and we are new followers of them. Their podcast is all about uh, the third season of TV shows and how the third season is often the make or break season for many of these shows. Mm, it was for next um, year. Yeah. <laughs> so on X, they uh, contributed with Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy is a highly quotable film. I don't oh, know if you know this one, or not, yeah. but I'm a uh, very important. <laughs> I'm in a glass cage of emotion. Of emotion. <laughs> oh, Baxter, you know I don't speak Spanish. You eat a whole wheel of cheese? I don't know if I should be angry or impressed. <laughs> 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 Mr. Burgundy, you have a massive erection. It's the pleats. <laughs> <laughs> this is called Sex Panther. It's made with real pieces <laughs> of panther. 60% of the time, Every time <laughs> I killed a man with a trident, I saw that. You should probably lay low for a while. <laughs> Find yourself a safe house, some relatives nearby. You're probably wanted for murder. <laughs> <laughs> San Diego, which means whale, whale vagina. vagina. <laughs> <laughs> Mike hates Will Farrell, so he's not enjoying this at all. <laughs> I'll just Ron, Ron, tell us what love is like. <sighs> it's like this. Want to hold my baby, want to squeeze her tight, want to make some afternoon delight. <laughs> <laughs> the 
Yeah, All right, we have Alexandria Sams on TikTok who uh, gave us the Princess Bride. I don't think any inconceivable. Yeah, I don't think anybody would would disagree that the Princess Bride is a highly quotable film. Mm -hmm. I actually brought it up to one of my colleagues at school today, and he and I spent about ten minutes just like reciting the film. <laughs> <laughs> Go away, I call the brute squad. I'm on the brute squad. You are the brute the squad. squad. <laughs> or, it's uh, to blame. <laughs> it means the blood. <laughs> he owes you money. As you wish. Hello. Um, my name is Nico. You killed my father. father. <laughs> I want my father back, you son of a bitch. Um, we can go on for three hours quoting the Princess Bride, so I'm going to move on. Mm. Thank you, Alexandria, for that uh, submission. DJ Scoob, our friend Scoob over at the Undiscovered Entrepreneur, uh, gave us this on uh, tick on the I think it was on TikTok or X. He, he gave us this contribution. He said Spaceballs, Kevin's choice for highly quotable film. We home ain't baby, found home shit. Darling, home a ragtime girl. <laughs> Send me in my wife. What are we looking um, at now? We're looking you know the at guy that now. the guy that says uh, we ain't found shit is the Vulcan dude from Voyager. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Tuvok. Tuvok, yeah. Um <laughs> we're looking at now now. When will then be now? Soon. Soon. <laughs> He's an asshole, sir. I know that. What's his name? That is his name, sir. <laughs> asshole. Major, Major asshole. asshole. Who's he? I... That's his cousin. He's an asshole too, sir. <laughs> How many assholes do I have on this ship? Yo. I knew it. <laughs> Surrounded by assholes. <laughs> I always love like subtle lines that kind of go missed. So like two of my favorite subtle lines in the film are when they find out that there's a button that'll stop the self-destruct and when they pull the box it says out of order and he goes, fuck, even in the future nothing works. <laughs> and the other one is when the bearded lady steals the, the escape pod and he's like, you get back here, you fat bearded bitch. <laughs> I love when they're about to go into uh, to hyperdrive. <laughs> Make sure. What's the matter, Colonel Sanders? Chicken. Chicken. Maybe you should I didn't even put Colonel Sanders together with like KFC. I just, yeah, well, that's when you're a kid. You, know, you don't you don't make that connection. You know, yeah. now it's like you you, you recognize it. You yeah. should buckle up, sir. I'll buckle this. <laughs> no, this sir, I, I did not see you playing with your dolls. <laughs> anyway, sir, I didn't see you playing with your dolls again, sir. <laughs> Why didn't anybody tell me my ass was over? <laughs> Scotty bit me. Scotty bit me twice last night, and it was wonderful. <laughs> Here we go, going off of a tangent on Mel Brooks. I know. Oh my god. Well, that's the other thing Scoob said. He said any Mel Brooks film is is uh, quotable, and we would definitely agree with that. We we actually anybody who's interested, go back to our first season. We did a whole episode on the career of Mel Brooks as a director. So you can go back and hear us talk about all of his films, all of his great quotes, and mm -hmm. hear how batshit crazy that episode goes because we really get off the rails <laughs> on that episode. So that is all the way back at season one. Uh, Rena Friedman of the Better Called Daddy podcast via Pods R Us uh, suggested Pretty Woman as a film that's highly quotable. That was on the other night, and I, I it started to bring back some memories. Slippery suckers happen all the time. Yeah, the two things that I remember from that are uh, the scene in the, the store where she's like, big mm. mistake, big, big mistake, mistake, you know. And um, there's one with uh, Jason Alexander's wife that she meets at like the the, the, the country club the or whatever, oh, yeah. horse race or wherever it is. And she's like, yeah, that woman's so cold you can freeze ice on her ass. <laughs> so there's a couple I remember from that one. Uh, Gaius, our friend Gaius from Back to the Blockbuster, no. suggested Mean Girls. Yeah, I was uh, surprised that was Gaius's suggestion. <laughs> and then messaged him back. They was, Yo, really? <laughs> so I've been on your pod. I've been we've been on his podcast Gretchen. together with the Dark Knight. I've been on his podcast a couple times for like some other films, and I'm like, man, there's other films that we talked about are I think may way uh, more quotable than Mean Girls. <laughs> Give me the Dark Knight instead. <laughs> I would say I haven't seen Mean Girls that much. I've only seen it like a handful of times. So I remember Fetch and like Stop Trying to Make Fetch a Thing. On Wednesdays, mm -hmm. we wear pink. Uh, <laughs> a couple Good of and Loser were going shopping. Yeah. Uh, David Jesse of the Tatooine Sons podcast 
surprisingly named Star Wars as a quotable film. <laughs> I kind of feel like if you host really? a podcast called Tatooine Sons, <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna shoot a promo for Star Wars. Maybe. Uh, the next one's pretty uh, pretty uh, reasonable too to think that a podcast called The Church of Tarantino would pick Pulp Fiction as a very quotable film. <laughs> I would hope so. Which I would also agree is a very very quotable film. Yeah. I mean, I could just I could just say here and, what again, motherfucker. <laughs> say one more time. I dare you. I double dare you, motherfucker. Is Why ain't Mark? no country I heard of? Is what is does Marcellus Mark? Wallace look like a bitch? <laughs> look like a bitch. Get my wallet out of the bag. Which one is it? It says bad motherfucker on it. <laughs> the Royale with cheese. Oh, with cheese. Which is what, they call, what do they call Whopper? I don't know. I, didn't I don't know. I ain't going to McDonald's. <laughs> I think <laughs> Samuel Jackson has probably most of the quotable lines in there. Mm-hmm. I like Harvey Keitel's line. Uh, you have a body minus a head and the trunk in the garage. Take me to it. <laughs> shot Marvin in the face, man. <laughs> Why'd you do that? I didn't mean to fucking do it. <laughs> you hit a bump or something. I ain't hit no fucking bump, motherfucker. <laughs> uh, that's a great one, Pulp Fiction. Uh, Regina Ricci on Instagram, who I believe is a friend of yours, Kev. Yes. <laughs> uh, suggested half baked. Yeah. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. You're, You're cool. okay. Fuck you. fuck you too. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> My name is Dave and I'm addicted to marijuana. <laughs> marijuana. This is uh what's his name? Uh uh oh my god, why can't I remember his name? Dave Chappelle. No, not Dave Chappelle. Not Dave Chappelle, uh the guy from Full House. Oh, um uh, shit. the dead one. Yeah, <laughs> I met Bob the man. Saget, Bob, Bob Saget. Saget. I shook his hand. I met him at Sands Casino. <laughs> I couldn't remember his name. He like gets up in the Whoa, crowd. He's like, "You're addicted great to marijuana. Tonight, marijuana isn't an addiction. I used to suck dick for coke. Have you ever sucked dick for coke?" <laughs> mm. uh, and then cousin Mary Kate. <laughs> cousin Mary Kate Sandlot. suggested Sandlot. You're killing me, Smalls. You're killing me, Smalls is probably the one that everybody knows you from that. You play ball like a girl. I was thinking of uh, forever. Forever. <laughs> he wasn't, it, the thing was, you were always, he was always getting into a pickle. Yeah. I got yeah. us into the biggest pickle any of us The ever biggest been pickle yet. we'd ever been in. I always remember two one. things. That's a good summer one, too. When uh, when he's talking about the guys at the end, what happened to him? The one kid uh, got real into the '60s, and they never heard from him again. <laughs> and then uh, Squints married Wendy Peppercorn, mm-hmm. and they have nine children. <laughs> 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 so that is uh, our list of the most quotable films as suggested to us by the people who gave us these things on our social sites. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining in and 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 helping us out with that. And let us know what you think. And following and. Yeah, and all just, that just good stuff. being great people, that's all, you know, being good people. Mm. Uh, Mike, uh, I feel like it's, <laughs> it's weird that I didn't do this first. I usually do this first, but I wanted to get the quotes out of the way. But did anything special happen this week? This week in film history. In 1929, the first Academy Awards, Wings, Emile Jennings, and Janet Gaynor win. Yeah, and I, I remember talking about this before, but I looked it up because I wanted to make sure because the first Academy Awards, actually the first like decade of Academy Awards were kind of strange because they had the actor and actress who won didn't just win for one film. They won for like the body of work that they did that year. Ooh. So like they won for like all the films they did. But then they also had two awards for Best Picture. There was Outstanding Picture and most unique and artistic picture, which I think is odd because they probably could have used that nowadays. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the popular film can win Best Picture. Yeah. So Wings won the Best Picture, and a movie called Sunrise won the Best Artistic Picture. And then they had two directing Oscars: one for Best Director in a Comedy Picture and Best Director in a Dramatic Picture. 
I would love that too if they had comedy as a separate category in the Oscars. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Probably be more interesting. Uh, what's your next one there, Mike? In 1986, Top Gun, directed by Tony Scott and starring Tom Cruise, premieres in the U.S. I think that's a film we can put on a list of very quotable films. I, I have that. Need, the, the need, need for, for speed. speed. You just get a bunch of dudes in a bar singing. Uh, She's lost, lost that, that loving feeling. feeling very badly. Yeah. <laughs> I also think of a line that the uh, the the commander or whatever he is says to him, and he's like, "Your your uh, your body's cashing, your mouth's cashing checks, or something." Like, it was your body's writing checks that you're, you're you you can't cash or so. I don't remember the full line, but it's something about like that. I had a friend who used to say it all the time. I like the one where you know he's like, "How did you see him if he was in that kind of a dive?" Well, we were inverted. <laughs> oh, shit. oh i got a great very p- boiler picture of it <laughs> or the best the best quote in the movie it's from val kilmer ready <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who couldn't hear that leo chomped his mouth together i just chopped my teeth together yes uh what's the next oh talk about quotable films <laughs> in 2002 star wars episode 2 attack of the clones directed by george lucas starring Ewan McGregor, Hayden Christensen, and Natalie Portman opens in cinemas. And the world is exposed to Hayden Christensen as Anakin Skywalker. Are we ready? Are we ready for the, yeah. quote, the the quotable film portion of this? I hate sand. Sand. It's so coarse and rough and gets everywhere. <laughs> I did or Natalie, just... Natalie, Natalie yeah. Portman seeing him for the first time in, in like 18, in eight years or whatever. She's like, Annie, you grown. And and it's like at that moment you can hear Padme getting slippery. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't want to bash on Hayden Christensen. I, you know, I, I feel that he did the best. He could his what he was he got a bad, you know, bad dialogue. Yeah, mm-hmm. he did the best he could, and he I, I could. love that. Uh, if you see it, there's a, a video on YouTube when he gets uh, introduced uh, at the uh, celebration anniversary celebration. Yeah, and they announced that he's going to be returning for the Ahsoka series and all that stuff. And he got this like massive standing ovation. And he's like teary eyed because he wasn't expecting it. And it was like it's really cool to see him like kind of get get a little bit of love there because I I don't blame it all on him. No, you know, no. stiff dialogue and you know. And honestly, the uh, I mean, it keeps coming up as a not a meme, just a I guess a short on YouTube is the uh, Obi Wan Kenobi where. Yeah. Uh, you know he's exposed like in this. Mm-hmm. Oh, I gotta rewatch that series. I, I, yeah, I need some more Kenobi. I at least want to watch that that episode again, where where the where he you know he says like you didn't kill Anakin, Anakin. I killed Anakin. Like that's a great yeah. fucking scene. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and your last one there, Mike. In 2019, Rocket Man film based on the life of singer John Elton, starring Taron Egerton, premieres. At the Keynes Film Festival. You would try that again. John Elton. John Elton. <laughs> oh, oh, Elton John. Sorry. That's not even a Russian name. 8.6% alcohol by body, boys. Elton John at the Cannes Film Festival. This is one that pisses me off because this is in terms of like the Oscars. I thought Taron Egerton should have got nominated for Best Oh, Oscar. yeah. This is the year I think Rami Malik won for Bohemian Rhapsody. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think. He was the better performance, but I still think Taron Egerton should at least gotten a, I got a nomination. Nod I mean, he it. sang yeah. all the songs himself. He was it was he was awesome in that film. Yeah. Uh, Mike, give me must try beer craft uh, tonight. I have a beer destination. It's Sun King Spirits in Indiana. Sun King offers handmade beer, spirits, and food from several partner restaurants. The modern food hall with Within the 15,000 square foot tap room features sandwiches and sausages from Mexico cuisine to brick oven pizza. Where am I at? It, it's like a mall food court, but with modernized local and independent restaurants serving diverse fresh food and paired with Sun King's handcrafted beers and cocktails. There you that go. Sounds pretty nice. Yeah, it does. We have a place around uh, us in uh, Cherry Hill called uh, Foodie Hall, and mm. it's got to have like 
I don't know, eight or nine different restaurants just within the vicinity, which used to be nice when Forgotten Boardwalk was still around because they were right around the corner. Unfortunately, they no longer exist. Mm. Where'd you say that was, Mike? That was in Indiana. Indiana. Okay, so I don't know any other reason to visit Indiana, so maybe we go visit that place. <laughs> we could see the Hoosiers. 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 Go to a Colts game, something, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if the Eagles are playing the Colts, we can go. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, and we'll go visit the brewery. <laughs> yeah. All right. Hey! hey. We're, we're working again, folks. For those of you wondering what the hell's going on, we had a moment there where we stopped recording and we weren't sure if it was going to happen again. But we're back. So we're going to go into Kevin's segment while we're still able to. Beer news is good news. Beer is good! Beer is good! Beer is good! And stop! Beer is good. Beer is good. Beer is good. Let's go drink some beer. 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 You're up. Beer. I, I don't got anything. No, you're <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Of course, I have stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, say goodnight to Kevin. I'm about to kick him off. Mike and I are going to finish the show ourselves. <laughs> No, seriously. What that whole pause was because <laughs> gotta figure it out. <laughs> gotta be professional. <laughs> what have we been professional? Gentlemen, maybe someday, you know. Pardon me uh, for wanting to try after 151 episodes <laughs> to be professional. Why start now? <laughs> so someday the uh the the broadcasting guys will look back at the uh, 151 episodes we've done, and say these these guys here they deserve to be in the museum uh, of beer and brewing <laughs> in Milwaukee, which apparently is now open. If you're interested, if you're traveling to uh, Milwaukee, which I believe is and who is in Wisconsin, Um, you may want to go inside Milwaukee's Lincoln Warehouse, which is surrounded by breweries, and visit the Beer and Brewing Museum. I'm sorry, I should, it's actually Museum of Beer and Brewing. Um, and it's going through the history of beer, which is rather extensive. Um, they've been working on the museum for about five years. They have a large collection of steins and beer tap handles. Um, and, uh, the president, uh, Gary Luther is going to share stories of beer and home brewing from around the continent. Um, so there's that everybody, you know, book your tickets now for Milwaukee. <laughs> yeah, next time I'm there, I'll, uh, go and visit. Yeah. And where we go from the history of beer to the science of beer, scientists have now brew brewed a killer bee beer. Scientists from Cardiff University have used brewer's yeast that resides in the gut microbiome of killer honeybees in Namibia and applied it to a uh, applied it to develop a unique craft beer. Um, The beer has been developed by a group of scientists working uh, Cardiff's, U- Cardiff University School of Pharmaceutical Scientists. The Pharma Bees Project is exploring how the pollination of certain plants could lead to the development of drugs and treat superbugs and antibiotic resistance. And somewhere along the line, we got back to Cardiff. We used the isolated killer bee brewer's yeast, along with yeast from Welsh honeybees, to make several batches of beer. Now, what if you're allergic to bees? Uh, that's a great question. Or if you're allergic to pollen. Oh. Yeah, I mean, Jesus. It, it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the killer uh, bees, the killer beer is what they've named it, aims to combine sci- scientific understanding of microbiology and carative research to bee-related products to produce something unique. The scientists are now looking for uh, brewers to collaborate with to bring the killer bee beer to market. Uh, and the proceeds will go towards support bee research in Wales. So, no, not Wales, like, you know, yeah, not ocean Wales, Wales, the country. 
<laughs> I'm glad I had my mic off. You <laughs> heard the sound of me pissing myself. <laughs> Not Wales. Wales the country. No Wales. Not Wales himself. W A L E S Wales. <laughs> All right, <laughs> back to the news. Uh, <laughs> Blue, Bell Bell ice cream. Cream. Blue Bell Ice Cream has released a new flavor, uh, which is, and this is for the kids who are listening to the show right now. This is a Blue Bell uh, A&W Root Beer Ice Cream Float Flavor. Um. Yeah, no, that's it. It's a video, so I'm not going to play the video and, and tell you guys what's going on. So just check that shit out somewhere, and that's it. That's beer news. Beer news is good news. Brought to you by Newsly.me, 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 Audio Super F Rivers, and Android, the reason to you in a natural human voice. So it's rolling. Start. <laughs> Fuck, I don't even remember this. <laughs> Stop scrolling. Start listening. Go to newsy.me today. You uh, for men to get your first month premium subscription for free. Um, that's what we should use for beer news. <laughs> while you were about the first thing in the beer news, I was planning a road trip. So I figured next year when they do the beer awards thing in Las Vegas, yeah, we head west first to Indiana and we hit, <laughs> uh, we hit the place that Mike uh, talked about. Then you shoot up northwest a little bit into Wisconsin mm-hmm. so we could visit the beer museum and then. Down, uh, go south again a little bit and head west out again to Nevada. Hit the, mm-hmm. the show in Las Vegas and then come home. There you go. <laughs> we'll rent an RV. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing can go wrong on that. No. <laughs> we'll be right back after this short word from Coffee Brothers. I love a good beer, but right now I can use a good cup of coffee. Have you heard about Coffee Brothers? Oh, yeah. They're that coffee company out of New York, right? Well, they're more like a coffee wizards of New York City. They source these amazing seasonal blends and single-origin coffees. It's like a flavor adventure in every cup. And get this. They roast everything in small batches. None of that mass-produced stuff. It's like each bean gets the VIB treatment. VIB? Very important bean. Hmm. Sounds fancy, but is it worth it? Definitely. Plus, they're a two-person team. I mean, that's dedication right there. Two brothers, one mission to caffeinate the world. And right now, you can save 10% on your order. I mean, who doesn't love a good discount? All right, you've convinced me. Let's get some Coffee Brothers now. Coffee Brothers, where every cup is a sip of perfection. Save 10% on your next order with the code FNF10. That's FNF10. Cheers to great coffee. Cheers. All right. We are back from the short break with our main segment this evening. Tonight, we are looking at the career of Alan Rickman. Our main inspiration for this is we recently did a uh, episode on the 25th anniversary of Dogma, which he is in. And as I was researching it, I realized he was also in Galaxy Quest that year, meaning that it's the 25th anniversary of that as well, which is one of my favorite Alan Rickman performances. So instead, instead of doing like all these episodes on anniversaries, let's just do an episode on Alan Rickman. You can't go wrong with that. So we're going to be talking a little bit about his uh, biography, some quotes, some trivia about his life, and of course, looking a little more deeply at his filmography itself. So first, I'm going to play this little video I have, which is the top 10 performances of Alan Rickman's career. And uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, you'll be able to see the video here. If not, you can follow along because I'm sure Alan Rickman's roles are usually so iconic. You'll be able to know what they're talking about anyway. And then we can discuss a little bit if we agree with the uh, the uh, order of this list here. With the tide unto another broad. For there is nothing lost that may be found if sought I think you ought to know I'm feeling very depressed well 
We have something that should take your mind off things. It won't work. I have an exceptionally large mind. It meant no harm. Your meaning is immaterial. Mark me. If I see your face again on the street, you'll rue the day you were born. Almost finished. Almost finished? What else can that be? You're gonna dip it in yogurt? Cover it with chocolate buttons? Who knows? We're going to pop it in the Christmas box. But I don't want a Christmas box. But you said you wanted a gift wrap. I did, but... This is the final flourish. Can I just pay? All we need now... Oh, God. By Grabthar's hammer, by the sons of Warvan, you shall be avenged. Now make yourself useful and give me that towel, will you? Honestly, you bottom feeders and your arrogance, you think everybody's just trying to get in your knickers. What are you? I'm pissed off is what I am. Do you go around drenching everybody that comes into your room with flame retardant chemicals? No wonder you're single. Loxley! I'm going to cut your heart out with a spoon! Why a spoon, cousin? Why not an axe? Because it's dull, you twit. It'll hurt more. Love you. I really, truly, madly, deeply, passionately, remarkably, um, deliciously love you. I really, truly, madly, passionately, remarkably, deliciously, juicily love you. Deeply. <laughs> oh, yeah. What was it you said to me before? Yippee Kaye, motherfucker. <laughs> I have to thank the uh, Next of Kin YouTube channel for providing that video for us this evening. Um, Always. There's two lists that I found. There was a, a Watch Mojo video, too, that had a top 10, but that was like 20 minutes long, so I couldn't really show that. And um, their their top three were very similar to the, to the Next of Kin list. I also like the Next of Kin video because it had my favorite Harry Potter quote <laughs> Always mm. in it, so I had to include that. So what did you think of those, those videos? So, uh, Number 10 got cut off a little bit. It was Sense and Sensibility. Mm -hmm. um, but the top five were Sheriff of Nottingham. Yep. Uh, there was Truly Madly Deeply, Hans Gruber, Severus Snape, and uh, I think it was... Um... Oh, shit. I already forgot what the other one was, but I was know the top... Galaxy Quest or was that... It was New Galaxy York? Quest. Yes, you're right. Galaxy Quest. <sighs> For me, I think a lot of people would say Severus Snape is number one because he did so many films and he was played the character for so long and, and the current generation probably knows Snape best. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but my number one is still Die Hard hmm. uh, because it's the movie that made him a movie star. You know, without Die Hard, we might not have Alan Rickman. So, and then I see, I the one that stands up to me, the one I remember him most in is, um, is Robin Hood, Prince of the East. Mm -hmm. And not that the movie itself was great, but his performance in the movie was fantastic. I mean, you can argue that the only reason to watch the film is him. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Christian Slater. And Christian Slater. <laughs> well, you can also yeah. say that with um, mm -hmm. Hitchhiker's God. The only reason to watch is for Alan Rickman's betrayal of the robot. <laughs> the robot, yeah. Like, they had that number nine. I would probably put that a little higher. Yeah. Um, I say my number one would be, would be Hans Gruber. Two would be Snape. Three would be the Sheriff of Nottingham. Mm -hmm. Four would be Galaxy Quest, and uh, five would probably be uh, Marvin, the paranoid android, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and then maybe like Sweeney Todd right after that. Yeah, Sweeney Todd. You know, me. I would definitely keep Truly Madly Deeply on there. Um, I've never seen the Sense and Sensibility version that he's in, so I don't, I can't say much about that. There's another movie he was in uh, called uh, Something the Lord Made, which is a really good film, and. So, Probably could have had a spot on the list. 
I did like his, you know, you can't forget him and Dogma, too. That's got to be up there. Oh, that's 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 what number five was. I think it was Galaxy Quest and Dogma. Yeah. On that list. Yeah. Oh, I can't forget Dogma. Fuck, now I got to redo my list. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, born uh, February 21st, 1946 in West London, England. Alan Rickman showed an early penchant for the performing arts. He cut his teeth as an actor in 1978 when he joined the Royal Shakespeare Company. He earned a Tony Award nomination as the star of 1988's Les Laisons des Arrues, then came to American consciousness that year as terrorist Han Gruber in the big screen blockbuster Die Hard. His film credits include the notable Harry Potter series, as well as Tim Burton's Sweeney Todd, Alice in Wonderland, etc. Uh, Alan Rickman unfortunately died of cancer on June 14th, 2016. Um, a, a, a loss that hurts now, especially when I watch his films, because it's like there's a few actors who when I watch their films and I think about it, I'm like, man, it fucking hurts. They're gone. And it's Alan Rickman's one. Robin Williams is one. And Heath Ledger is like another one for me. Like when I see them on screen, I'm like, fuck, man. <laughs> Too soon. Uh, I have here some quotes from him. So I thought these were kind of cool because they were like just, just little like tidbits. Uh, when asked about Die Hard, he said, I got Die Hard, Rickman later recalled, because I came cheap. They were paying Willis $7 million, so they had to find people they could pay nothing. <laughs> um, which would then change later on when he was offered, or they wanted to give him the role of the villain in The Last Action Hero with Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, but he was a little too expensive at that point, so they used Terrence Stamp instead. And hey. Terrence, or not Terrence Stamp, I'm sorry, uh, the guy from uh, Game of Thrones who played... Uh, Tywin. Tywin Lannister. Uh, yeah. Um, I can't think of his name right now, but he 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 played the role instead. And when he find out that the only reason he got the role is because they didn't want to pay Alan Rickman, he started walking around the set wearing a t-shirt that says, I'm cheaper than Alan Rickman. <laughs> <laughs> I got to look up his name. He's going to bother me now. But So uh, when asked about his career, Alan Rickman said, there was an inevitability about me being an actor since about the age of seven. But there were other roads that had to be traveled first. So, like, he did a lot of, you know, different things uh, growing up and then, you know, didn't really uh, make it in acting until 1978 uh, when he got his first, like, role on TV on a BBC production of Romeo and Juliet, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, <clears throat> so he's a man that's kind of, like, humble about his career, which is cool. Mm. Never got a, an Oscar nomination, which I think is fucking robbery. Here's the guy's quick. name is Charles Dance, by the way. Charles Dance. I see. I was I was on the IMDb page trying to find it just now. No, I figured Charles I'd do it Dance. while you were talking. Yeah, I get dance and stamp mixed up for some reason. <laughs> on well, acting, you want to see a dancing stamp? Yeah, that's what you want to see. Uh, he says, "I don't see any of my roles as one word. It doesn't matter what I'm playing. It's not one word." And I think any actor would say the same. You know, he's a man who really put himself in those roles. And some of the roles, like, you know, he mainly is known for his. Britishness, especially when you hear him as like Snape and stuff like that, but he could change his accent when needed. Um, in the one movie I was talking about with the Lord, uh, something the Lord made, he he has a Southern accent in that film, and it's pretty believable. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on Harry Potter, I said to Joe Rowling, "Look, I can't play him unless I know him." She then gave me this elliptical piece of information that I didn't really understand at first. It was information she hadn't told anyone else, not even her sister. But it gave me what I needed to take on Snape. And uh, I have a little something about this in the trivia about his knowledge of the character of Snape that he had and nobody else did. And then he would make like decisions on, on set and the directors would approach him and say, why did you decide to play the role like that? And he would say to the directors, because I know things you do not. <laughs> <laughs> this is so fucking cool. So uh, let's take a little look at some trivia about uh, Alan Rickman. Um, if we want to take turns, like picking some of these out or whatever, it's fine. Um, but despite being J.K. Rowling's first choice to play Snape in Harry Potter, she actually envisioned him while writing the character. He was only given the role after Tim Roth backed out the star in Planet of the Apes. Tim Roth was the studio's preferred choice. Tim Roth mistake. 
<laughs> I don't get that. I don't see Tim Roth playing the Snape character. I mean, I like Tim Roth. Um, mm-hmm. I think it was a bonehead move to do Planet of the Apes instead. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm trying to picture him in a role, and I can't. Like, it's just it's one of those roles where like I can't picture anybody other than than Alan Rickman <laughs> at this point. You know, even like when Dumbledore was replaced, eventually Michael Gambon grew on me, but like I couldn't see replacing Alan Rickman at all. Right. Um, this is the thing I was telling you about. Not long after playing Snape, Rickman told some character secrets about Snape that would not be otherwise revealed to the last book. Uh, Rowling had let him in on this stuff. Most significantly, for over seven years, Rickman was one of the very few people other than Rowling to know that Snape was in love with Lily Evans, uh, later Lily Potter. When they were students at Hogwarts, both Snape's protection and antagonism towards Harry comes from that. Rowling said that she shared this information with Rickman because he needed to understand, I think, and does completely understand and did completely understand where this bitterness towards this boy, living proof of Lily's preference for another man, came from. When the directors of the film would ask him why he was playing a scene a certain way or delivering a line in a particular matter, Rickman would simply reply that he knew something that they did not. (laughs) <laughs> going back to charles dance he was uh alan rickman was considered for the role of bennett in last action hero but he was deemed too expensive oh wait a second we went over this one yeah that's the one that says he wore the t-shirt I'm uh, i thought we were talking about another movie that charles <laughs> dance got the role for wah, 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 wah. Wah. His betrayal of Hans Gruber and Die Hard earned him a spot on the American Film Institute's list of the 100 best heroes or villains as the 46th best villain in film history. I think that's low. (laughs) Hans Gruber should be a fucking top 10. (laughs) For Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, he turned down the role of the sheriff twice before he was told he had carte blanche with the interpretation of the character. (laughs) <laughs> thank god <laughs> yeah just yet. if if not we might not have got lines like uh rip your heart out with a spoon call off christmas you 10 15 you 10 20 bring a friend bring a friend <laughs> when he shot the scene of hans gruber falling from the top of the building and die hard he actually dropped he was actually dropped by a stuntman from a 20-foot high model onto an airbag. To get a genuine surprise look, the stuntman dropped him on the count of two instead of three. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of shit that happens to you when it's your first movie role. <laughs> they wouldn't have been doing that shit to 2010, Alan Rickman. This is a story we told on the, uh, the Dogma episode that uh, Kevin Smith cast him in Dogma after he stated in an interview that Smith's Chase and Amy was one of his favorite movies of the year. Rickman's presence on set called J- caused Jason Mewes, who played Jay, who was going through a drug problem at the time, to be on his best behavior. He memorized not only his lines, but the entire screenplay. In his words, I didn't want to piss off that Rickman dude. <laughs> 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 so uh, there's the Charles Dance last action hero thing we saw we talked about. Yep. <laughs> This is funny. Two researchers, a linguist and a sound engineer, found the perfect male voice. It's a combination of Alan Rickman's voice and Jerry Ironman's voices uh, based on a sample of 50 voices. It's interesting that Jeremy Irons and Alan Rickman had the perfect male voice to combine when both of them played the brothers in the Die Hard franchise. (laughs) Simon and Hans Gruber. Mm -hmm. Uh, Alistair Looking Glass was dedicated to his memory. He took cello lessons for his role in Truly Madly Deeply. And even though he handles the bowing hand, his left hand is provided by a real cellist standing behind him with his arm under Alan Rickman's armpit. Uh, He was really old to play the role of of Snape. Snape. Like Snape in the books was not that old a character. Um, He was 11 years older than Timothy Spall, who played uh, Wormtail. He was 20, 12 years older than Andrea Rollins and Gary Oldman. He was 17 years older than David Thewlis. 21 years older than Gerald, Geraldine Somerville, who played Lily Potter. 
But nevertheless, the character that the six have been playing in the Hotter, Harry Potter films are meant to be contemporaries and former classmates. Mm. Right. I feel like the way he portrays it, though, you can forgive it. He and also worked play. with the uh, actor who played Wormtail in uh, Sweeney Todd. That's right. Yeah, he did. Yeah. That's uh, Timothy I, Spall. Yeah. I'd kind of be surprised if he didn't have uh, a strong friendship with uh, Emma Thompson, considering how many films they worked on together. He, he does. Yeah, he had a very strong. In fact, I, I'll talk about it later when I talk about that book I was telling you about. She wrote the uh, the intro to the book. <clears throat> Galaxy Quest originally contained a mention of his character, Alexander Dane, having been knighted by Queen Elizabeth. He asked that it be changed because he believed that that was inconsistent with the character and all mentions of the knighting were removed. However, in the credits, he's still listed as Sir Alexander Dane. <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> While filming Die Hard, he was found to be proficient at mimicking the American accent. So the scene in which Hans Gruber and John McLean finally meet was added to the screenplay. Uh, he was voted number 19 in Empire Magazine's Greatest Living Movie Stars over the age of 50. <laughs> what year was it? <laughs> uh, in summer of 2015, he had had a stroke which led to him being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He did not let it be disclosed or revealed to the public until after he already died. Hmm. Like Nobody really knew he was sick. He was offered the role of Leonardo Leonardo in the 2000 cartoon series based on Kevin Smith's Clerks. Originally, the character was modeled after Hans Gruber, but the design was changed upon Rickman's request. The studio then decided not to go with Rickman, and the role uh, then went to Alec Baldwin. <clears throat> His marriage to Rima Horton in 2012 was so secret that nobody knew about it until 2015. <laughs> and he actually um he talks about her a lot in that book uh, he and she were were high school sweethearts and they remained with each other the rest of their lives and you know it's funny they got married in 2012 but they had been together since like the 60s <laughs> no, uh, he, he was, wanted to be sure yeah. <laughs> he was twice nominated for broadway's tony award for best actor for la liaison de Giroux and the revival of no cowards private lives Ranked number 59 in Empire Magazine's top 100 movie stars of all time. He uh, auditioned for the role of Moff Jer Gerard in Star Wars Episode VI, Return of the Jedi, which then went to an actor named Michael Pennington. Empire Magazine in, in 2007 uh, chose him as one of the 100 sexiest stars in film history. He was number 83 on that list. In a documentary on his personal diaries, it was revealed that Rickman had privately battled prostate cancer in 2005, which resulted in removal of his prostate. It is believed to be related to him being diagnosed with terminal pancreatic cancer a decade later. He auditioned for the character of Rimmer in the BBC show Red Dwarf. Ooh. <laughs> I love Red Dwarf. I would love to have seen it without Rickman. <laughs> in April 30th, 2023, he was honored with a Google Doodle. <laughs> He is uh, born on the exact same date as Anthony Daniels, who played C-3PO in the Star Wars films. Uh, despite his casting as a villain in films like Die Hard and Robin Hood, in real life he was descri described as a very kind and very gentle man. Bonnie Bedelia, who co-starred with him in Die Hard, later said that she loved her time with him on set when the cameras weren't rolling. He was a very sweet and loving person. And in his entire career, he only appeared in one film nominated for Best Picture, Sense and Sensibility, in 1995. That's just a little bit about the life and trivia of Alan Rickman. We're going to take a look at his filmography real quick. So his early filmography is mostly television. So we're going to kind of like, I would say we can kind of like ignore that a little bit. But his very, very first on-screen role came in 1978, uh, which was a BBC televised production of Romeo and Juliet, in which he played Tybalt. And <clears throat> the nice thing about that, that it was recorded by the BBC, means that I was able to find it. So here is Alan Rickman in his very, very first film role, 1978. I was one years old. Mike was 20. <laughs> <laughs> I was four, damn it. <laughs> Swords, you know not what you do. Stand me, Ben Valier. Look upon thy death. 
I do, but keep the peace. Here! Put up thy sword, or manage it to part these men with me. What drawn and talk of peace? I hate the word, as I hate hell, all Montagues, and thee. <laughs> Definitely seemed like the Prince of Cats. <laughs> yeah. I'm also looking at going like he was like probably like twenty yeah, he, something there and he, still looked like he did like in his sixties. <laughs> no, I, I I looked at him and look at the haircut and I went, if he was redheaded, he could be a Weasley. <laughs> <laughs> he looked like he could have been uh one of the uh, Beatles. Yeah, a little Dutch boy going. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> he was a man who was Apparently not afraid to wear the tights. So. <laughs> tights. Tights. So I have to bring up my IMDb thing here again there because my MacBook just died on me. So here we go. So, yeah. So 1978, he did Romeo and Juliet. Uh, and then a bunch of TV series, mostly TV movies, Weatherby, Summer Season. Uh, it wasn't until 1988 when he got his big break, which was playing the role of Hans Gruber in Die Hard. So I'm going to kind of start from there because I feel like that's really where like his career took off and where it really like makes sense to start. So yeah, Die Hard 1988. As we were like looking at that clip of like his best roles and all, I was thinking to myself, I got a black cherry uh, milkshake in the freezer waiting for me right now. And I'm really looking forward to it. And I might have to watch Die Hard while I'm eating it later. <laughs> Especially since that was the movie I, I decided to, to, to do my Muppet recast. <laughs> I'm going to go back and watch Quickly Down Under because I don't remember him in it. Oh, yeah. He's yeah, Quickly no, Down he Under. Oh, shit. He was yeah. the sheriff in that, too. Or yeah. He was, um, he, was the, he was the antagonist. He was the villain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he did Die Hard. Then in 1989. But he was also the law. Yeah. He was the January man. Uh, did a couple more TV series after that. Um, and then, yeah, his next film role was 1990, Quickly Down Under, starring Tom Selleck. <laughs> uh, it's like a Western, but it takes place in Australia. Yeah. Uh, weird setup. But, yeah, I have to go back and rewatch it, man. Well, I haven't watched that in fucking forever. God. It's another film yeah, where he's the, only, he, he's the only reason to watch it. Because <laughs> he plays one of those over-top villains in it. Tom Sally keeps going around to all the ranchers saying, I can give you a reverse mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> After that, in 1990, he does a film called Truly Madly Deeply, okay, right. one of the films I believe he could have been nominated for. The premise is that, is that him and his wife were girlfriend, very mm. in love, and he passes, and she's struggling to move on, and he she sees his ghost, right? Yeah, he Not comes back as a, he, he comes back as a ghost, and uh, you know to, to stay with her and all that stuff, and like she mm-hmm. doesn't want to let him go, and you know he eventually needs to be let go, and it's you know that kind of thing. But it's it's a really wonderful performance from him. It's again, well, it's another trying to move on, and he's trying he he's reluctant to move on, isn't he? Yeah, I think it's kind of like eventually she decides like yes, I need to move on, but he's still not willing to leave. Right. At one point, he moves in with like all these other ghosts that he's friends with. Yeah. <laughs> all the ghosts are like living in the house, freeloading. Uh, then he does a movie called Closet Land. I never heard of it. And then we get to 1991 when he does one of his most iconic roles, the Sheriff of Nottingham in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. So I, I, I another reason I pulled that clip, Kev, is because your favorite quote was in it. <laughs> <laughs> Why a spoon, cousin? Why not a blade or an axe? Because it's blunt, you idiot. It'll hurt more. <laughs> Again, the only real reason to watch Robin Hood is Alan Rickman. Mm, and the man made a favorite. career of like creating iconic villains. In 1991, he does a film called Close My Eyes. 1992, a movie called Bob Roberts. Fallen Angels, a TV series in 1993. He appears in one episode. A movie called Mesmer in 1994, which he talks a lot about in his uh, <clears throat> his diaries, which I'll be getting to a little bit later. 
uh, an awfully big adventure in 95. And then in 1995, he stars in Sense and Sensibility uh, with Emma Thompson and Kate Winslet. It's the only movie he was ever in that was nominated for an Oscar for Best Picture. Another role he could have been nominated for himself, but was not. It's just a travesty to me that he never got an an Oscar nomination in his career. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a movie that shows a different side of him and that, you know, we're so used to him being these over-the-top villains. And in this one, he's the, you know, main character, love interest, uh, you know, sincere character. He is sense. And Emma Thompson is sensibility. Yes. They are detectives who are from opposite sides of the tracks. Yes, if it was Pride and Prejudice, he'd be the pride. He would. <clears throat> um, from there, he does Lumiere and Company. Uh, a TV film, uh, it's an interesting film, it's called Rasputin. And he plays the role of Gregory Rasputin in it. And it's one of those films that showcases his ability to change his accent and become a different character because he does a very, very believable Russian accent in the film playing the role of Rasputin. Uh, I think it's kind of an overlooked TV movie that, that I wish more people have seen. Uh, then he appears in Michael Collins. I forgot that he was in that. Yeah, he plays the IRA Leon leader. Galera. Yeah. So Michael Collins is a film stars uh, Liam Neeson, mm-hmm. Aiden, uh, Julia Aiden Roberts, Quinn. Aiden Quinn. Yeah, and he's he's got a small role in it, Alan Rickman. It's a historical biopic of the Irish revolutionary Michael Collins, man who led a guerrilla war against the U.K., Negotiating the creation of the Irish Free State. It was and, tough getting the guerrillas into the UK because they're not <laughs> natural to the UK. No, no, yeah. But they are good fighters. <laughs> and they can hold their alcohol. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> did, the, did the guerrillas go through Wales or with on Wales? <laughs> <laughs> they rode on, they Wales, rode on Wales, Wales to the shore of Wales. <laughs> And then walked on foot up into Ireland. And then realized they were on the <laughs> wrong fucking island. It's yeah, my I mean, island. <laughs> stole some unicorns from Scotland. <laughs> uh, then, <laughs> fucking, lost, fucking just lost my place. And he does an uncredited, guest, unc- uncredited role in a film called Winter Guest. A, movie, a video game called The Space Bar. I have never heard of this game. Never heard of it. He must, he must have needed money at that particular point. <sighs> or they just threw some fucking money at him and he was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> the space bar follows Detective Alias Node as he searches for a shape shifting killer inside the Thirsty Tentacle, a fantastical bar on the planet Armpit Six. Armpit Six? What the fuck? <laughs> 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 I need to find this video game. How did or we least, miss that video game? <laughs> or at least, like, it sounds like it, like it tried to be Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you know. I, um, I have to see if there's like a video on YouTube of that or something. Dude, that sounds batshit. Uh, then he does a movie called Judas Kiss, a movie called Dark Harbor, and then in 1999, he returns to form as uh, one of the most incredible actors to ever live when he plays the role of Metatron in Dogma. If you'd like to hear more about our views on Dogma, uh, listen to episode 149. That was our episode on the 25th anniversary of Dogma. And his amazing role as Metatron in the film. Also in uh, 1999, one of my other favorite roles of his, the role of Alexander Dane in Galaxy Quest. By Grapfall's hammer, by the sons of Warvan, you shall be avenged. <laughs> I love the fact that he plays this actor in the film who's like a serious actor, Shakespearean guy who's disappointed with his career because he got stuck on this like Star Trek ripoff show, but is never out of costume the entire film. <laughs> <laughs> never takes the costume off. <laughs> Even when he's home alone, like just, you know, sitting in his couch watching TV. Uh, and one of my favorite scenes is they're, they're at like a car dealership <laughs> and they're there to like cut the ribbon on the opening of the dealership. And he has to say, he has to say the line uh, by Grapthar's hammer. What is savings? And he doesn't <laughs> want to say. So he's like by Grapthar's hammer. <sighs> what the <a> savings? <laughs> now, he was known as somebody who didn't like sci-fi. He was not a big fan of the sci-fi genre, but loved the script too much to say no to it. And, and I'm so happy he didn't because he's 
amazing in that film as well. Then he does a voice in a film called Fishtail. I vaguely remember this movie. Mm-hmm. It's an animated film. Um, but I mean, I don't know much about it, but I kind of feel like I heard of it. <laughs> I don't know. It was at the time where there was a lot of like animated films coming out trying to like ride the coattails of Toy Story, you know? Right, and I think this one might have come out at the same time that that one with uh, Angelina Jolie and Will Smith came out, A Fish's Tail. Yeah, maybe that's the one I'm thinking of. I think I might be confusing it with that one. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, he does a TV special called Victoria Wood with all the trimmings, a music video called Texas in Demand, uh, a movie called Blow Dry, We Know Where You Live, live. A film called a short film called Play, and then it's in 2001 that his possibly most iconic role, arguably his most iconic role, uh, happens when he plays Professor Snape for the first time in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Uh, and then this is like a run for him where he's in like a movie like just about every year for the next like 15 years. Mm-hmm. So he does the Sorcerer's Stone 2001, Search for John Gissing in 2001, King of the Hill TV series 2002, he does a voice. He does The Chamber of Secrets in 2002, one of my other favorite films, Love Actually in 2003, a movie that Mike still hasn't gotten all the way through because he can't get used to watching Bilbo Baggins play a porn star. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm telling you, Mike, if you watch the movie and just skip the scenes that Martin Freeman's in, the movie still works. <laughs> And it actually makes it about an hour shorter. So. <laughs> if I if I get time, with all the other movies, I still have to go back and watch. Yeah, and quickly down under. <laughs> and then uh, he does Prisoner of Azkaban in 2004. And this is the movie I was talking about. It's called Something the Lord Made. Uh, it's based on a true story. He plays Dr. Alfred Blaylock uh, with a very, very convincing southern accent. And he is takes on a protege in the film played by most deaf. And it's about like all these people are not giving this guy a chance because he's black at a time when you don't see many black guys becoming doctors, but Alan Rickman's character is willing to take a chance on him. It's a, it's a pretty good TV film. Uh, and then he kind of, in a way, reunites with most deaf because in 2005 he does Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Mm-hmm. Although he's never on, scene with, on screen with him, his voice is because he's the voice of Marvin the Paranoid Android. <laughs> I thought it was just a tr- depressed android. You know, he's a depressed android. In the in the book, he's referred to as the paranoid android. Um, uh, but you get lines like, uh, I have such an exceptionally large mind. Right. I'm so depressed. Well, that's life. Life. Don't talk to me about life. <laughs> when they find uh, the planet they've been looking for the first time, he, he goes, amazing. It's even worse than I thought. <laughs> Uh, then Goblet of Fire in 2005, a movie called Snow Cake in 2006, a movie called Perfume in 2006, Noble Sun in 2007, Order of the Phoenix in 2007, Sweeney Todd in 2007, a busy 2007. Mm-hmm. Um, why don't you guys speak on Sweeney Todd? I've seen it once. I'm not real versed on it, but uh, I know you I, guys have both I've, seen it. I'm more, ver- I've seen it. I'm more versed on the play. Mm-hmm. I've seen the play. Um, oh, this does uh, the play justice, I'd say. I mean, oh, yeah, I um, yeah, with uh, Johnny Depp per- portraying the titular ca- uh, character and Helena Bonham Carter. Uh, Helen, yeah, Helena Bonham Carter um, playing um, Mrs. Uh, I don't want to call her Mrs. Potts. It's not Mrs. She makes Potts. pies. This is Lovell. Love it. She Lovell? makes meat pies. <laughs> yeah. She's um, making the meat pies. Making the meat pies. He plays uh, but Judge it's well Durbin done. in the film. Mm-hmm. He plays the judge. Mm-hmm. And his co-star from the Harry Potter movies. Um, why Timothy can't I Spall. His name Timothy Spall. Right. Plays Beetle, the Beetle. Mm-hmm. Oh. Uh, I thought besides uh, um, Helen Bottom Carter. Yeah, how about a car is also in Harry Potter. <laughs> that's, mm-hmm. right. well, that's true too. That's true too. Um in two thousand eight, 
he does a movie called Bottle Shock, and this is where I got my drink uh, choice for the night because he plays Steve Spurrier, who was a uh, sommelier and wine expert who uh, convinces a, uh, a vineyard owner in Napa Valley to enter his wine into a contest in France, which is normally not, you know, welcoming of the American wines uh, mm. based on the true story. And he plays the blood half blood half blood prince in 2009, while his drink does a 10. Arena, a TV series in 2010. Alice in Wonderland in 2010. As the Caterpillar. <laughs> Who are uh, you? <laughs> Another film that's kind of a mess. <laughs> um, if you went in expecting to see the actual Alice in Wonderland, it's not the real story. It's a Tim Burton created story about it's it's basically a Tim the Burton to- fever dream. It's basically the return to Wonderland. Um, but he is excellent in it as the voice of the caterpillar, Absalom. Helen Bonner Carter's head's four times too big. <laughs> she plays the, the, the red, red queen, Queen of Hearts. Anne Hathaway's fucking weird in that movie. <laughs> Everybody's weird in that movie. That fucking movie's weird. <laughs> uh, but he's great in it, of course. Song oh. of Lunch in 2010. Oh, 2010. Then he does Deathly Hallows Part 1 and 2, uh, 2010 and 2011. Of course, his always seen in, in Deathly Hallows Part 2 will always be burned into my memory. I love that. Love that line. Um, Boy in the Bubble, short film in 2011. Gambit in 2012. In the, this is weird. I've never seen this movie. I remember when it came out, but it wasn't until I was doing like the research for this that I found out that he was in the movie, The Butler, uh, starring Forrest Whitaker. Ronald Reagan. He plays Ronald Reagan in the film. I don't movie. think I've seen The Butler. Yeah. I've not seen the film. I, I knew of it because I remember it had some like awards consideration that year. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it was produced by Oprah, which is another reason why I kind of heard of it. I did not know he was in it as Ronald Reagan. <laughs> it makes me half want to watch the movie just to see what his Ronald Reagan is like. <laughs> um, he does a movie called The Promise. Mr. Gorbachev. <laughs> Tear down, down the wall. wall. Well, Nancy and I. <laughs> I love um, the jelly We're going to start a program called Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the movie Star Wars. It's the missile defense Star Wars, just like it's not the whales that were in the ocean. <laughs> um, he does a movie called CBGB in 2013, Dust in 2013, Little Chaos in 2014, Eye in the Sky in 2015, and his final film before his untimely death is unfortunately Alistair the Looking Glass, where he returns as the voice of Absalon the uh, the uh, caterpillar. At that point, isn't he the butterfly? I think he is because it's the he becomes the butterfly at the end of the first film, I believe. Mm. Um, so maybe he is a butterfly. I don't know. I have actually not seen Through the Looking Glass. I saw the trailer for it and Sasha Baron Cohen's over the top, you know, antagonist in the film. And I was like, yeah, I, I had enough from the first Alice in Wonderland film where I had a fucking acid contact high watching it. <laughs> <clears throat> but that is the career of Alan Rickman. Any final thoughts, gentlemen, on anything? What's what's like? So we kind of talked about this already. Like your personal favorite role. So like mine is is Hans Gruber. Mike's was what you said, Marvin. Actually, it, it's mostly Snape. Mostly Snape. Snape. Yeah. No, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say that that's a bad choice because this fucking Snape is iconic. Mm. I mean, it's one of those. It depends upon what he's playing. I mean, I love him when he's doing his comedy, mm. Dogma, and Marvin. But what he's he's such a great villain. Mm. So let's say like I think, you know, the s- part, sheriff of Nottingham. Nottingham was a great one, yeah. So I was gonna say, like Snape aside, what would you choose? Probably the sheriff. Probably the sheriff as well. Mm. <clears throat> I can't argue with any of that. I, I mean Alan Rick is one of my favorite actors. The fucking travesty, he's never had an Oscar nomination, so <clears throat> but that is, uh, you know, our, our little coverage on the life and career of Alan Rickman. Um, 
last few episodes, we've been doing some book recommendations, and I decided to continue that tonight with a book recommendation directly uh, dealing with Alan Rickman, one that I discovered this week as I was doing a research, and I started reading it earlier this week, and it's really good. The book is called Madly Deeply, and it is Alan Rickman's actual diaries between the years 1993 and 2016. Um, shortly after he passed away, his wife, uh, Rima, gathered his diaries together that he had been keeping over this time and had it published in its entirety, unedited. So it's not even like it was like cultivated or anything. It's just his straight thoughts from 1993 on. And it's it's an interesting read because it's cool to see like the days that mon are like mundane. You know, you don't often get to see those mundane days among actors and celebrities and all. And there's like plenty of entries where it's just him like walking around London getting lunch. And then there's days. And it makes you remember that they're just real people. Yeah. And he's a very real person. I mean, he, all accounts of him outside of like acting or that he's just like a wonderful person. Mm -hmm. You know, and then there'll be things where he talks about like plays he goes to see and he gives his opinion on the actors in the play and the way the players present it. But then it really gets interesting when he starts talking about the movies that he's filming as he's filming them. So when he gets into like Harry Potter, when he gets into um, some of the films later in his career, it's, it's pretty interesting. Unfortunately, it didn't start when he did Die Hard. I would love to have read this diary back then. <laughs> but it starts in 1993. And at that year, he was making a movie called Mesmer. Uh, and he talks a lot about that at the beginning of the book. So if you're interested in hearing more about the uh, thoughts of Alan Rickman and, and, you know, what he was like outside of acting, you should check out the book Madly Deeply, The Diaries of Alan Rickman. Uh, so, uh, Mike, do you have any beer trivia or history for us this evening? Yes, I have a fun fact. Uh, some grade schools in Belgium offer students low alcohol beer under 2.5% alcohol by volume. Rather than soda or other sweetened drinks, they can, as they consider beer to be a healthier alternative. Hmm. That's that's how they get the Budweiser overseas. I was gonna say I wish I had gone to school in Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> I got a juice box, a carbonated juice box. <laughs> I got hard cider juice box. Yeah. Well, um. I mean, the kids that Kevin are, are teaching, they're they don't need to be drunk to be, you know. They, uh, right <laughs> uh, they're the tiktok generation they don't watch movies mm. <laughs> jaws what's jaws, jaws? What the hell jaws? Is, that? is that a movie about a dentist <laughs> uh so how are your drinks this evening not bad not bad at all again no, i'm surprised yeah. that you chose that one I think between the two the mexican lager was my favorite kind of got me into the summer vibe but the uh uh, Dortmunder Gold was not too bad either. Well, for having to use the Prosecco as my uh, my alternate to the wine I wanted to drink tonight, I did kill the bottle, and it is 11% alcohol by volume, so I'm feeling the 11% alcohol by volume right now, and I really, really want my black cherry milkshake now. <laughs> <laughs> black cherry milkshake. milkshake. Mm -hmm. All right, so... Uh, thank you again for joining us tonight for episode 151. This is our season eight finale, the uh, career of Alan Rickman. We hope you enjoyed listening to the podcast as much as we enjoyed recording it for you. Don't forget, you can drop us an email, films of at gmail.com, or visit linktree.com slash films of fermentation. Find all of our social media and podcast links. You can find out more about us at the deluxe edition network.com, the den, where you can find more about our podcast, the other den podcast, including the May podcast of the month, the Stephen Crypto Show. Again, uh, thank you to uh, Pods R Us, Magic Numbers 3 when it comes to TV Pod, Alexandra Sams, DJ Scoob of the Undiscovered Entrepreneur, Rena Friedman of the Better Call Daddy podcast, Gaius from Back to the Blockbuster, Dave Jesse of Tatooine Sons, the Church of Tarantino pod, Regina Ricci, and Cousin Mary Kate for submitting their uh, suggestions for movies with the best quotes or most quotable films. Thank you for listening and and submitting to the pod uh we are going to be taking a little bit of a break since this is the season finale mike's going to wait on vacation so we are going to be returning on tuesday june 4th with our season nine premiere so don't forget to stop by the crossroads between pickled and ferment it for season nine's premiere episode 152 uh as we do with most of our premiere episodes we're revisiting one of our favorite topics films that time forgot so this is the eighth part in our Films That Time Forgot series. 
So join us on Tuesday, June 4th for the season nine premiere. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I will be releasing a few mini pods in the interim. I'm going to have a mini pod review of uh, three films that I saw recently. They are uh, Late Night with the Devil, Abigail, and the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. And then after that, we'll be returning on June 4th with Season 9 premiere, Episode 152. Again, I'm Leo. I'm Kevin. I'm Mike. This has been the Films and Fermentation Season 8 finale. You've been listening to us. Uh, We appreciate it again. Cheers, folks. Cheers. Cheers.